Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to my channel. So the case that I have for you guys today is one that is solved, but it does involve the death of a young teenager in a very disturbing way. So if cases involving children make you especially uncomfortable, this is your warning now that this video may not be for you. But either way, before we get into the video, I wanted to go ahead and say a huge thank you to today's sponsor, Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of inspiring classes for creatives like me. It allows you to explore new skills, deepen your existing passions, and just get lost in your own little world of creativity. They have thousands of classes for creative and curious people on topics like illustration, graphic art, design, photography, film and video, and so many more. Most of Skillshare's classes are under an hour with short lessons that fit almost everybody's schedule and skill level. The class that I'm taking right now is called The Ultimate Self-Care Playbook, Discover and Nurture Your Sense herself taught by Jonathan Van Ness. I get so many super sweet messages from you guys asking me how I'm doing, how I handle being in school for my doctorate in addition to always reading these disturbing cases all the time. For so long, I was just to work, work, work. I didn't ever wanna take breaks or take time to myself because there was always something I could be doing and always something that I could be getting done. But this class has helped me not only learn the importance of self-care for my own mental health, but also for improving my quality of work. It has taught me so many amazing techniques for just allowing myself to take some time to myself and do something relaxing and worry about the stresses of the world later. I'm so grateful for this class teaching my high-strung self how to just take care of myself better. Skillshare is curated specifically for learning, meaning that there's no ads and they are always launching new premium classes so you can stay focused on wherever your passions take you. It's really nice being able to actually take charge of learning things that you've always been so curious to learn. As you can see, it doesn't just help you learn new skills for art and creativity, but just for how to take care of yourself. Skillshare's entire catalog now offers subtitles in Spanish, French, Portuguese, and Dutch, which really just expands the possibilities of those of you who will benefit from it. The exciting news is that the first 1,000 of my subscribers that click the link down in the description box below will get a one month free trial of Skillshare so that you can start exploring your creativity today. Thank you again so much to Skillshare for not only teaching me how to take care of myself better, but for sponsoring today's video. So with all of that being said, let's get into today's case. Today, we are going to be discussing the death of Riley Crossman. Riley Crossman was born December 22nd, 2003 in Martinsbury, West Virginia to her parents, Chantelle Oakley and Lance Crossman. She was described as being absolutely beautiful inside and out with a contagious laugh. She was a natural artist, a talented dancer, and a beautiful singer. She absolutely loved little kids and they loved her just as much. She was known to be intelligent, caring, and helpful, yet stubborn and about as dramatic as teenage girls come. She spent her time between her parents' houses in Martinsburg and Berkeley Springs, West Virginia because her parents were divorced but she spent most of her time in Berkeley Springs living with her mom, and that is where she went to school. She had also been dating a young man named Hayden Lacey for about eight months before she died, and by all accounts, they were super close and they adored each other. Her dad, Lance, said that Hayden is a pretty good kid and he was a positive influence on her. He says that since being with him, she was pulling up her grades and was doing pretty well for herself. So Tuesday, May 7th, 2019, Riley had gotten home from school at around 3.30 p.m. and when she got home, her mom, Chantel, was taking a nap on the couch. Chantel worked two jobs, so she was at work while Riley was at school, but she wasn't feeling too well this day, so she asked to go home early from her first job so that she could go ahead and take a nap at home before starting her next job. Chantal knew that Riley was a very reliable girl, so she asked her to wake her up when she got home from school, and she knew that she was going to. So when Riley got home from school, she woke her mom up and made sure that she was up in time to get ready for her evening shift at her job. After Chantal left for work, Riley went about her evening as normal. Riley's maternal grandma grandmother was at home with Riley as well as her two younger brothers until around 7 p.m. As far as Chantel knew, Riley stayed at home and was just chilling in her room that entire evening. So when Chantel got home at around 10 p.m. that evening and walked past Riley's door and saw that it was shut, 
She pretty much just figured that she was in her room and didn't think anything of it. Again, Chantel really was not feeling well that day, but she couldn't get time off of work to be homesick. So when she got home, she pretty much just fell asleep immediately. Then according to Hayden, Riley's boyfriend, the two were on FaceTime until around 10.30 p.m. that night. Then another one of Riley's friends said that they were texting each other until almost midnight that night. After that, she wasn't on her phone that night until 5.40 a.m. when she tried calling Hayden, but he was sleeping, so he didn't answer. By 7.15 a.m., Chantel woke up and started getting ready for her day. So she went into Riley's room to go and check in on her, but Riley was not in her room. But still, she didn't really think much of it. Riley's school was basically right across the street from their home and she walked to school every day and school started at 7.45, so leaving early to get to school early to socialize a bit before heading to class was pretty normal for her. In addition to this, Hayden was going on a field trip that day, so it was pretty normal that Riley would wanna show up early to school before he left on the field trip so that they could chat and she could say goodbye. So that day went on pretty much as normal until Chantal had gotten a message from the school saying that Riley hadn't showed up to some of her classes that day. Of course, that did set off some red flags for Chantel, but just as so many parents would think, she thought that maybe she was just playing hooky from class to act out and be a rebellious teen. I also do want to note that some of her teachers had marked her as being in class because they didn't fully take attendance, so it's not like she was missing the full day. It was more so marked that she just missed a couple of classes. However, by 3.30 p.m. that day, Riley's grandmother or Chantel's mother realized that Riley was not at home when she was supposed to be. So she alerted Chantel, who was at work at the time, and Chantel immediately started trying to get a hold of Riley to figure out where she was and what she was doing. It was really weird that not only was she not home at her normal time, but Riley hadn't texted her mom all day. Riley was always asking her mom if she could hang out with someone after school, whether it was Hayden or friends or go to an after school event or something. She was pretty much always texting her mom at some point throughout the day. But this day, there was nothing, so Chantel tried texting her. However, these text messages would not deliver, so she tried calling her, but her call went straight to voicemail. She then tried sending another text, but again, this text also would not deliver. So it was either that her phone was dead or it had been turned off for whatever reason. This was very unusual for Riley, but still Chantel thought that maybe Riley had a dance rehearsal or something after school that she forgot to text her about. So Chantel asked Riley's grandmother if she could go to the school and see if Riley was anywhere there. So she walked across the street to Berkeley Springs High School to see if she was there and looked around wherever she could think of, but she didn't find Riley anywhere. So at around 5 p.m. that day, Chantel decided to leave work and go to the school herself so that she could look around and try to find Riley. When she got there, she noticed that Riley's boyfriend was in the parking lot because he had just returned from the school's field trip. She went up to him and asked him if he knew where Riley was, but he said that he hadn't talked to her all day because he was on this field trip. So Chantel went inside the school and started walking around and going anywhere that she could think of inside of the school, but she could not find Riley anywhere. So Chantal returned home to see if maybe Riley had shown up while she was out looking for her, but she hadn't. She went upstairs to her room to see if anything had changed or if she was there, but she wasn't. At that point, Chantal was mixed emotions of upset and scared. Obviously, she would be upset because at that point she thought maybe Riley was just skipping school and going and hanging out with friends and doing rebellious teen things. So she was kind of expecting Riley's gonna come home, I'm gonna be really upset at her, she's gonna be grounded, and all of this will be a big misunderstanding. But then there was also this other part of her that knew just how out of character this was for Riley. She knew that she wasn't someone to just go out and not say anything to her mother. She knew that Riley could tell her anything that she needed. She knew that she would probably say yes if she wanted to go to something after school. So there was really no reason for Riley to go out, skip class, and not tell her mother where she was. So of course, there was this other part of her that was absolutely terrified and worried about what was going on. However, 
as more time passed and absolutely nobody had heard from her, she called 911 to report Riley as missing. Also right away, Chantal called Riley's father to let him know that she was missing. At the time, he was at a work thing, so he didn't answer the phone call when she initially called, but when she had called him two times, he knew that something was wrong because she would never call twice unless it was something very serious. He lived about a half hour away from them, so at that point, he drove over to Berkeley Springs and on his way on the drive, he tried to get into contact with Riley, but of course, none of his messages or phone calls were going through. He then drove around the very small town of Berkeley Springs and tried asking any teenager that he could spot to see if they knew where Riley was. One person did say that they spotted her walking nearby, but the sighting wasn't confirmed and it easily could have been a case of mistaken identity. Nobody who actually knew her had seen her or spoke to her that day or had any idea of where she was. So at that point, everybody knew that this was serious. After this, huge searches were done. Police got involved. They had tons of volunteers and they tried to search anywhere that they could to try to find Riley. They searched every square inch of the school and the surrounding land around the school. They searched around the neighboring houses and the neighboring communities. During this time, Riley's boyfriend was one of her biggest supporters. He was trying to help find her every single waking moment since day one. At that point, nobody had any idea what could have possibly happened to Riley. Riley was only 15 years old at the time, so obviously she didn't have her license and she didn't have her learner's permit or anything, so there was no way that she had access to a car to drive off and go somewhere. And again, none of her friends had seen or heard from her all day, so there was really no reason to think that any of them had picked her up. There was really nothing else in her life that could indicate that she wanted to run away. Everybody knew that something was wrong and they were worried that she had been abducted. They made several pleas to the public to help them find her and get her home safely. But then police went ahead and searched her bedroom and this told a completely different story. In her bedroom, they found small spots of blood on her pillow as well as on her top sheet and on a Victoria's Secret ribbon that was in her room. After further testing, these spots of blood came back as being mixtures of blood and saliva and the DNA was a match to Riley's DNA. They also found her wallet as well as her glasses and she could not see without her glasses in her room. So all of these things put together pointed towards her not being a runaway and pointed towards something possibly happening in that bedroom. They continued searching as much as they possibly could until May 16th, 2019, when their absolute worst fears came to fruition. Police found a body on the 5500 block of the Tuscarora Pike near the top of a mountain in Berkeley County. And right away, just based off of the clothes that she was wearing, police were confident right away that this body belonged to 15-year-old Riley Crossman. When she was found, she was laying on a contract grade trash bag with a white t-shirt on, long pants, and one shoe which was untied. Then under the long pants she was wearing shorts and these shorts were unzipped and unbuttoned and her underwear appeared to be ripped and tattered. They also found a white chalky substance on her body, which looked like it could have been drywall mud, but they weren't too sure initially, so they sent it off for testing. So of course, Riley's body was sent off to the medical examiner for an autopsy. However, I guess her body was so decomposed at that point that they couldn't determine an exact cause of death. Now, this really confused me because they found her only eight days after she went missing. So she would have only been dead for eight days at most at that point. Let me know in the comments if you guys know more about the weather conditions in that area of West Virginia at the time, but to me, that seems like really fast decomposition. But either way, despite this, they did rule her cause of death as being homicidal violence. I think when making the official ruling, there's a lot of other things that go into the cause of death besides like the physiological processes that they find. 
it's pretty obvious that Riley didn't go up to the area that her body was found herself. It's obvious that she didn't only just put one shoe on her foot or rip apart her underwear. The way that her clothes were put on also looked as if someone else had redressed her because her pants were hiked up really high. So just based on all of those different aspects, I think that's how they were able to make that ruling even if they couldn't necessarily determine a cause of death. At this point, of course, her family is absolutely devastated. They had no idea what possibly could have happened or who could have wanted to hurt Riley. So police immediately started their investigation and asking for tips. Also, of course, police went ahead and questioned everybody who knew Riley. With most investigations or probably all investigations, those closest to the victim, including their family, are the ones that police want to rule out first. That includes Lance, her father, her stepmom, Jessica Bishop, her mother, Chantel, as well as her mom's boyfriend, Andy McCauley. Everyone in the family who police interviewed told their stories, their accounts of that day, and everybody's story appeared to be consistent. None of them had any red flags or anything else that stood out to them, except for one person, Andy, Chantel's boyfriend. Now, as they were going through their investigation, police received a tip from an eyewitness who saw a green Dodge 2500 work truck with a ladder rack backed into an area between the residence and their shed at 10 a.m. on May 8th. The witness actually noticed this because it was a friend of Andy and Chantel's, and the witness asked Chantel why was the car there, since they knew that it wasn't Andy's truck, and they knew that it wasn't Chantel's truck, and they knew that Andy didn't have his license at the time. So, it stood out enough to both of them that at the time, this witness reported it to police. Then police talked to Chantel about anything else that she she noticed about the day that her daughter went missing. She said that the day that Riley initially went missing when Andy got home from work, she of course told him that Riley was missing and he immediately ran into the house and then ran back out and then got onto his bicycle and drove off saying that he's going out to go ahead and look for Riley. But then as everyone else was out searching that entire day, when Chantel got back home from searching, she went inside and saw that Andy was just sleeping on the couch. While everybody else was out searching, desperately trying to find answers, being absolutely exhausted but not giving up, Andy was sleeping, and this really concerned her. Then when police interviewed Andy, they immediately knew that something was off. So first, when police asked him where he was on May 8th at the time of 10 a.m., he said that he was at his job where he worked as a construction worker and told police that he hadn't left the job site all day. However, after his coworkers had confirmed that he did in fact leave work that day, he later changed his story and said that he actually went off to go buy drugs from someone. But then he later changed his story again and said that he did actually go home to Riley's home to grab some drugs for himself and a coworker. This coworker thought that he was grabbing drugs for them and maybe was going going to visit a girl outside of work, and that's why he thought that he was gone. The co-worker told police that Andy had left work at 9 a.m. and that he didn't show back up to work until around 2 to 30 p.m. These inconsistencies just did not sit right with police. They soon connected this green truck to being one of Andy's co-workers and a car that he drove in quite frequently. So police went ahead and searched this truck and lo and behold, they found white dried drywall mud inside of the bed of the truck that matched the drywall mud that was found on Riley's body. Additionally, police used cadaver dogs to search around the house and as well as in this truck, and these cadaver dogs did alert the presence of a dead body having been within the bed of the truck at some point. Additionally, police found two sheet metal screws that were found on the roadway near where Riley's body was found. Police examined these screws and they found out that they were very specific screws, that they were like unique screws, they weren't just your everyday run-of-the-mill screws. And they came back as being the same screws that were found within this work truck as well as screws that were found in Andy's work belt. So Andy told police that he had traveled east on Route 9 to get back to his job site after leaving, 
but police found surveillance video that showed he was actually traveling back towards Wiley's house at 9 to 10 a.m. Then he was on Apple Harvest Drive at around noon near a Hernandez store, which is about six miles away from where Riley's body would be found. Then by 12.30 p.m., he was seen traveling west on at Tuscarora Pike, then east again at 1246, only two miles away from where Riley's body would be found. Then he was seen five minutes after this going to a nearby gas station. He can be seen on surveillance video from this gas station throwing something away from his toolbox, which was in the bed of his truck. He was then seen running into the store, putting money on the counter, and then running back out to get gas, and then leaves the gas station eight minutes later. Then he doesn't return back to work until 2 or 2.30 p.m. So clearly he was not where he said he was. He was going back to her house and then was seen near where her body would later be found the day after she went missing. Then some people who Andy worked with came forward to speak with police. They all said that it was very unusual for him to be driving this truck around. As I said earlier, it belonged to a coworker and that coworker was the one who mainly used this truck. The coworker would usually pick Andy up for work every day in that truck but for whatever reason, Andy was the one who was driving around that truck that night and then the next day. Then Chantel confirmed that Andy usually got around on his bicycle or she drove him in her car. Plus, again, he didn't even have a license, so he wasn't allowed to be driving anyways. So it was, in fact, very unusual for him to be making all of these trips and driving around in this car. Then another coworker came out to say that Andy had asked for three construction grade trash bags before leaving for work on the day that Riley's body was allegedly dumped. Then another former co-worker and past employer of Andy's told police about something really weird that happened to him on May 8th. So Andy and this man named Don had not gotten along in the past relating to disagreements with work-related things. However, on May 8th, between the hours of 2 a.m. and 4 a.m., Andy called this guy over and over and over again incessantly. Then he texted him multiple times over and over again saying that he needed somewhere to stay and according to Don, he was very clearly panicked. Don obviously didn't want him staying at his house, so I don't think that he ever let him, but this coworker figured that this might have something to do with Riley being missing. Obviously, this is very suspicious behavior for happening the morning before she was reported missing. In addition to this just being very strange behavior, this also contradicted what Andy told police about what he was doing the night that Riley went missing. He told police that he was at home and sleeping at the time until getting up for work the next day and leaving. When police asked him about the situation and pointed out the obvious discrepancy, he told police that he was just sick. He told them that he was sick and he just needed more drugs. He said that after he had gotten these drugs and was walking around with them outside, he saw a state police officer parked with their lights on at around 2 a.m. But police knew that there was absolutely no state officers out at this time and even if he saw a parked car and maybe thought that someone was inside, they knew that there wasn't anybody inside the cars to have the lights on. So they knew that he was lying about this. But either way, he told police that the reason that he was so panicked and was trying to get a hold of Don and was trying to stay with him was because he saw this state trooper with the lights on and just didn't want to get caught with the drugs that he had. But again, police knew that this was a lie. Police knew that this was not why he was trying to get into contact with Don because there was no state troopers out at the time. So that was an obvious red flag to say that he was lying. Obviously this most likely was the time after he may have murdered Riley, or maybe it was right before. Either way, police know that this had something to do with Riley and that it did not necessarily have anything to do with the drugs. So with all of this very damning evidence, right away, police decided that it was enough to arrest and charge Andy McCauley with first degree murder, concealment of a body, and death by child abuse. The trial for Riley's murder started on September 27th, 2021. A lot of the evidence that was brought up in trial were things that we discussed earlier, such as his truck being seen, the drywall mud found on Riley's body that matched the one that was in the truck, the screw found near her body that was also found in the truck and his work belt, testimony from the coworkers about the timeline and the surveillance video. 
but there was more information that came out by testimony shared at the trial. So first, Chantal testified about the night of and then the day after that it's believed that Riley was killed. Chantal said that when she arrived home from work that day at 10 p.m. on May 7th, she said that she saw Andy sleeping on the couch or what she said now she knows was fake sleeping. She said that when she got home, he woke up, but she noticed that he was bright eyed and not groggy eyed as you would be if you first woke up. She suspects that he was using drugs, specifically cocaine at this time. Then we know about his strange behavior when she initially told him that Riley was missing, that he went off, went on his bike and kind of disappeared. Nobody knew where he was until she got home and just saw that he was sleeping on the couch. Then prosecution discussed cell phone data that was found on both Riley and Andy's phone that day. Now the text messages found that Riley sent out are very uneasy and scary to hear. Now, it was a bit confusing. I don't know if these messages were found necessarily on Riley's phone because I believe that they were deleted from her phone after this all happened. So I believe that Andy took her phone and deleted these messages because he probably saw them. So I think these messages were found on Hayden's phone or specifically on his iWatch. At 11.01 p.m. on May 7th, Riley texted her boyfriend telling him that her mom's boyfriend just came into her room. She wrote, quote, Andy's in my room. Then 12 minutes later, she sent a second and final text message saying, I'm scared, babe. However, at the time, Hayden did not get these messages because unfortunately he was sleeping. Then as we know, the night that she was murdered or like the night before the morning that she was murdered, Riley and Hayden were on FaceTime. Hayden testified that at trial, the night that they were FaceTiming, Hayden had heard Andy go into her room multiple times. But these times he heard Andy coming into her room asking, her if she wanted to do things like dishes for chore money. But clearly she was uncomfortable because according to Hayden, Riley asked him to stay muted on FaceTime so that Andy wouldn't hear that they were talking. So to me, this just shows that she was scared of him. She was worried that he might do something to her. So he wanted her to stay on FaceTime, but he didn't want Andy to know that they were FaceTiming. They also found out that the morning that Riley went missing at around 3 a.m. on May 7th, they saw that Andy had called Riley's phone several times, but was blocking his phone number by doing star 67. He denied making these calls, but they were recorded. They were on record. He probably deleted them from both of their phones, but you know, the cell phone companies don't lie. The prosecution believes that this night he was making all of these calls to try and check on her, see what she was doing, and make sure that she wasn't on FaceTime with her boyfriend at that time. Then the prosecution went on to explain the timeline on why they believe Andy went to work and then left work after. They think that the night before she was suffocated with a pillow, hence the blood and saliva being on the different areas of the pillow as well as her bed. Then they believe that he left her there and then when he went to work he probably wanted to have an alibi not thinking about the fact that his co-workers might tell on him that he left or thinking about the surveillance video that was gonna pick him up they think that when he went back to the home he got her body and then disposed of her where she was later found so that's basically the evidence that the prosecution brought forward Yes, there is some forensic evidence, but this is largely a circumstantial case. And there's no real like set motive or history of behaviors, at least that I know of, for why he may have wanted to kill Riley. Chantel wasn't really able to point to specific examples of saying, here, this one time Andy did something really weird to her, and this happened and this is why I know he did it. And that was basically the defense's argument. They don't have a motive, so why would he have wanted to do this? They denied any sort of sexual motive, but the prosecution pointed to just how her body was found. Her shorts were unbuttoned and her underwear was torn and tattered. Her shirt was found with it pulled above her head and she was not wearing a bra at the time. And again, it was clear just by the way that her clothes were found on her that somebody had redressed her. So I believe that that is the official motive that they argued. Chantal, as well as Andy's own mother, say that they believe that he went into her room that night with the intent to sexually assault her. I think he went in there multiple times while they were on FaceTime to check 
and see what she was doing and make sure that he could get away with it. Both Chantal and his mother said that he had a tendency to become sexually aggressive when he's on drugs. And he admitted himself that he did do drugs frequently with his drug of choice being cocaine. Prosecution and others believe that the reason that nobody heard anything going on that night, one was because they were sleeping, but also because he used a pillow to suffocate her and prevent her from making any noise. And I would have to agree. I would have to say that I do believe that he probably went in there with the intent to sexually assault her and that's when he murdered her. So after only one week of trial, jury went into deliberation. Like I said, the trial was made up of mostly circumstantial evidence, so they deliberated for quite a while. However, at the end of it, Andy McCauley was found guilty on charges of first degree murder death by child abuse, as well as concealment of a human body. When the charges were being read, Andy showed absolutely no emotion. I mean, he didn't show really any emotion throughout the entire trial, so I'm not surprised by this whatsoever. At the sentencing hearing, there was an option to give him mercy, where he can get the chance for parole after 15 years, However, thankfully, this was denied. I think the fact that it was 15 years and then Riley was only 15 years old when her life was ended hit the family extra hard, so they fought against this pretty hard. Why should he get the chance for parole after 15 years if this beautiful life was ended after only 15. Thankfully, he is now facing life in prison without the possibility for parole. So that is where the case now lies. I feel absolutely heartbroken for Chantel. As far as I've seen, I don't think that she knew that anything was going on. I mean, how could she? She was literally constantly working, just trying to do what she could to make money and raise her children. I'm sure that she knew that Andy did drugs, but a lot of people are put into a situation where they just don't feel that they can do anything. I know that there was a phone call released where she just had a feeling that Andy did something. And this was a recorded phone call. And she basically said, all you had to do was just not be a junkie. And that's her words, not mine, but she knew that something was happening with his drug use and she knows deep down that that is what caused this entire thing. I'm sure she carries a lot of guilt. I'm sure she regrets letting this man who was on drugs into her home. But at the end of the day, the only person who's at fault is Andy McCauley. I don't want anybody sending hate towards Chantel or anybody else involved in this case. I'm also heartbroken for her dad, Lance. He couldn't have done really anything to prevent this. He lived a half hour away and he just wasn't close enough to know that anything could have been happening. And again, I'm sure he feels immense guilt for this happening in the first place but of course, it's not his fault either. Please don't reach out to any of Riley's family members. They're already suffering enough. They're already living through what happened and they don't need a bunch of people on the internet coming towards them and saying that they're at fault, saying that they should have done more to prevent this, saying that they let someone doing drugs into their house. I don't wanna hear any of that. Please don't reach out to the family. I specifically did this case to spread awareness on Riley's death because it just didn't get a lot of exposure and that's it. That's the reason. Again, please don't reach out to her family unless it's to say kind words. They're already going through enough and they don't need any more stress in their lives. My heart also breaks for Riley. Her life was taken from her far, far too soon, so abruptly. We know that she was terrified of Andy that night and who knows what she had to suffer before her life was taken from her. It's absolutely disgusting and disgraceful and my heart goes out to Riley, her family, and everybody who knew and loved her. But either way, that is where I'm going to end today's video. If you like this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. And make sure to turn the notification bells to on so you don't miss any of my future videos. Make sure you go ahead and click the link down below and head over to Skillshare to try your one month free trial. Don't forget to go ahead and follow me on Twitter and Instagram, which will also be linked down below. And if you have absolutely any case suggestions, please make sure to go ahead and send them over to my email at rachelshannoncases at gmail.com. With that, I hope you guys have a great week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye.